Another edition of Outside Shots presented by TheLines.com. You can follow us on X at The Lines. U.S. previewing the national championship. One seed versus one seed. UConn, as of this recording on Sunday afternoon, a six and a half point favor. Total right around 146 against fellow number one seed, the Purdue Boilermakers. UConn coming off that late cover against Alabama. Purdue pulling away and covering against NC State, both first half and second half line. And if you look at Alabama's shooting performance, going back to UConn and Alabama, teams to shoot 45% from three were 35 and seven straight up in the final four since 85. UConn, like I mentioned, covers against the Crimson Tide. They've covered 11 straight NCAA tournament games. First off, Eric, how you doing? Second off, second of all, how surprising are those two Nuggets? Well, first of all, I'm doing good. Uh, <laughs> one one day, one game to go. Uh, took in the Final Four yesterday with some friends at a, at a, at a bar, as I typically do. Um, entertaining game, especially the second one. I think the first one was a little bit of a slog. But um, no, I mean, it was a good time, and it's always enjoyable to watch those games go off. As far as the games go, um, those numbers that you said, not very, not terribly surprising to me. Um, as I said, that, that game, that first game yesterday was a little bit of a, you know, a slog. It was, it was, you know, NC State probably had their worst game offensively in almost three months. Um, Purdue obviously had something to do with that, but still not the greatest showing of NC State. That was the wrong time for regression for them. Um, we talked about Alabama and UConn. Um, very interesting game. You know, I kind of said that Alabama, if in order to be competitive, they were going to have to throw something, um, different at UConn or they had to be very, very lucky. They were very, very lucky in the first half. They shot the three pointer very well, but then the old regression monster caught up with them in the second half and it was just too much. It's just amazing how UConn can just beat so many different teams in so many different ways. And that's why, you know, while the analytics sites like mine have UConn as a raw number, as a raw favorite of like two and a half or three points, I mean that, as you said, that that spread has ballooned to six and a half or seven right now. That's how many people believe in UConn. Yeah, and it opened five and a half. And as we look at the point spread from a market rating standpoint, sports books, bookmakers, odds makers want to shade the line more towards UConn. This isn't any sort of a mind blowing nugget here because mm-hmm. of the inevitable action on the Huskies. If this thing opens four, four and a half, and I have it closer to UConn, like minus. 4.2, but if it opens right around four, four and a half, you're going to get a, a flooding of UConn bets and money for that matter coming in six and a half. You're going to get maybe even seven. If this shoots up to seven on game day, as we're recording this year on Sunday, probably a good handle when it comes to Purdue and UConn bets and money. So you're going to have dog lovers that say this line's too high and the money line up mm-hmm. to Purdue plus 235 at some shops. But MGM, I think, still has it at plus 225. So to that point, I, I think the line is the sports books have this one exactly where they want it. You could, mm-hmm. you as an Eric, you as in the listener or viewer could say the line is inflated and you may be right, but sports books are going to get good two-way action, which is exactly what they want from their standpoint. Now you go back to 1999 as long as this one doesn't close in the four or five range and we see a ton of bets of money come in on Purdue, forcing this one down, which it won't. It's going to be the second highest point spread for a one seed versus one seed since 1999 when Duke was minus nine and a half against the Huskies and the Huskies upset Coach K and the Blue Duke Blue Devils. And then also you go back to 1939. So if UConn covers... Once again, which would be their 12th straight NCAA tournament cover, the last loss ATS and straight up for UConn was going back to two years ago in the tournament against New Mexico State when apparently Dan Hurley couldn't win a tournament game. They would be the first team in NCAA tournament history to cover and win back-to-back titles covering every single game going back to 39. That is incredible. <clears throat> so when we talk point spread, Eric, when we talk – the market rating here, where are you looking to bet? How are you looking to bet this game? And what do your numbers say on the service either side of the ball? I'll start with you. Yeah, so when it comes to the over-under, um, I'll, I'll start there. I think I have that one at about 142.5. As I said, the raw number for UConn is, is UConn by 2.5. Now, that will 
move a little bit. I understand how that would move closer to three and a half or four because of, uh, if you look at the average performances of UConn this season, their performances away from home were actually better than their performances at home. That That is not the case for Purdue. Granted, Purdue's played quite well in this tournament, but still, a lot of their rating is ballooned because of the, the way they perform at Mackey Arena. And that comes into play. And that's why you see the raw numbers is going to be a little bit smaller than what the supposed spread is. Like you said, about a 4.2. That feels right to me. But for me to see it, you know, any, for Purdue to be a six and a half or seven point underdog against anybody in this country is just a tough thing for me to swallow. And I look at this and go, as, as good as UConn has been, you know, I tweeted about this last night, even considering they're my number one team in the country. And you look at the the average play throughout the entire season. They've outperformed their season norm in 11 of 12 games. It gives you an idea of what kind of momentum they're bringing in. But at the same time, Purdue has outperformed their norm in 7 of 9. So I think that a lot of people look at UConn. They've been dominant. They're the defending champion. They can beat anybody in any given style. And they seem to have some sort of answer for Zach Eady in the form of Donovan Klingon in this game. That being said... Uh, you know, this, this is just such a big gap for me. Normally, when you look at these games... And you look at analytics sites versus the spread, you're only talking about maybe a half a point, point, point and a half a difference. Here you're talking about a difference between my raw numbers and what you're seeing in Vegas at somewhere in the four to four and a half range, which is really quite remarkable. Um, for me, I think it's still a little bit overblown, my opinion only. So I'm probably going to ride Purdue plus six and a half or plus seven here just because I look at Purdue and go, it's as hard for anybody to beat Purdue by six and a half or seven points, even if it is UConn. You cannot, UConn can have an off day and then Purdue walks to an easy cover on this one, even if they don't win the game. So let's start like you have kind of touched on here with Purdue offensively. Mm -hmm. Zach Eady, only 20 points against NC State. I believe 12 rebounds. You look at his points rebounds prop, 24 and a half juice to the under, 12 and a half boards at BetMGM, also juice to the under. Remember, you could bet $5, get $150 in bonus bets at BetMGM Sportsbook with your first bet using promo code The Lines. One word, terms and conditions over at thelines.com. You can find all of our bets in real time in the Lines Discord channel. The link is over at thelines.com in the top right hand corner. Comment or leave a review with your favorite picks for this game, Apple, Spotify, wherever you find a favorite podcast. If you're watching the show, Outside Shots here on YouTube with myself and Eric Haslam, leave a comment with your favorite bet whether it's a prop or point spread total, you can tail Eric here on Purdue plus six and a half. So when we talk about my Purdue bias, because like you hit on alluded to, you're likely if you already have bet Purdue plus six and a half here, we are seeing DraftKings six and a half minus minus one fifteen popping in UConn's direction. So like I touched on from the top, I wouldn't be shocked if this one closes at some shops, Purdue plus seven minus 120 somewhere in that range but I still think six and a half minus 110 both ways is the consensus closing number here I don't see it getting to seven minus 110 each way now you look at Klingon against Edie which as you hit on theoretically a favorable matchup for UConn and you look at the raw numbers here for UConn defending the low post, Klingon specifically in the tournament, allowing 0.29 points per possession on post-up attempts per synergy. It's pretty good, but then you look back at UConn overall this season, the most post-up attempts that they've faced this year was 14. Purdue averages 18 post-up attempts per game, which is no shock. An average of 21 in the tournament. And the thing with Edie is, and listen, I've been wrong about Purdue in the past. I've been wrong about Matt Painter throughout this tournament. Not that I've picked against Purdue a ton, but my overall notion with Matt Painter and Zach Eady, and as much flack as I want to give Purdue and Purdue fans and Zach Eady in general, the guy's been unbelievable, especially that game ceiling block on Dalton Connect in the Elite Eight. You could argue that Connect should have ball faked on that one, but either way, Eady has come up big, and he stayed out of foul trouble too, another plus for Purdue in this game. But Eady is so good at reposting where I don't know if the overall raw numbers for UConn defending the low post with Klingon mean as much to me. You watch film with Purdue and Edie specifically. When he doesn't have, when he gets the ball too high, he'll repost, get better spacing for the shooters around him. And Purdue is one of, if not the best, pure three-point shooting team in the country. And you go back to UConn versus Creighton in Omaha, which was UConn's last outright loss. And they got 
Klingon in ball screen action a lot. And that's where Klingon can sometimes get in trouble with pick and roll. And Edie is a much better pick and roll player. Purdue operates at a top 60, top 65 pick and roll frequency. And the other thing with Edie versus Klingon that I think is going underlooked here, Edie can go a full 40 minutes-ish. Klingon about 25, 30. So I look at this and you could say seven foot two versus seven four. That's an edge compared to Purdue's previous opponents. Yes, but I still think Edie's ability to repost gives him an upper hand and the fact that he's more durable despite his insane size. Yeah, you know, with the repost uh, concept, that's going to be the question of how Connecticut's going to attack this. Are they going to allow um, Klingon to kind of handle this one-on-one, and then when Klingon's not out there, can Samson Johnson carry the load defensively? Um that's going to be the question to see what UConn, how UConn handles it. If they are, they're content to let Kling kind of take him one to one on one and say, we're going to cover those guys. We're not going to really drop down and double ED as much. We're going to give them that chance to score up front. And like you said, um, with, with UConn defensively, they're going to be opportunities for Purdue to score on the inside. From an analytical standpoint, UConn is 175th in the country in defensive near proximity attempt rate. They're, they're opponents who are going to get shots off on the inside. The problem is, because of guys like Klingon and Samson Johnson, when you look at defensive near proximity percentage for UConn, number one in the country, looking at the the average D1 opponents will shoot just 44.6% on the inside. Those are shots that are going to be alley-oops, layups, dunks, anything within five feet of the rim. 44.6% on average in D1. That's elite. And then that's going to be a problem. Now, obviously, Zach Eady is far beyond average when it comes to Division One. So we're, they're going to, but they may test their hand on this. I wonder wh- how much they're going to rely on Klingon to handle the one-on-one battle and say, we're not going to drop down. We're not going to expose Purdue's outside shooters and let them get wide open threes. It's going to be interesting to, to me to see how Dan Hurley handles this. If he actually is going to try that one-on-one approach with Zidi until in uh, with, with Edie until <laughs> Edie proves that he can actually score consistently against Klingon, at which point UConn probably has to make an adjustment. You got me hungry there. I was thinking about <laughs> Z- Zig Zidi or Zidi. Zidi, however Z- you want Z- to pronounce Z-Dash it. Zidi, 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 Zach Edie. Exactly. <laughs> so you mentioned how UConn is going to handle the one-on-one or potentially post traps. UConn is so good. That's the other thing. Even though they've only faced fewer than their fair share of post-up attempts in the tournament, the weak side defender That's what Hurley tends to rely on when they do post trap. And then that allows them to get back and rotate over and not allow the open threes. But they are vulnerable in draft coverage. So when you look at Purdue's mid-range efficiency, Braden Smith, 98th percentile in mid-range frequency, 60th in efficiency, this per CBB Analytics. Fletcher Mm -hmm. Lawyer, 74th in mid-range frequency, 85th in efficiency. Mason Gillis, 45th percentile mid-range, frequency 73rd in efficiency. Now, with Smith in particular, we were touching on this off-air before we got started with the podcast. Castle is going to be, you would assume, all over Braden Smith. Now, you and Jordan, going back to our Final Four podcast, you guys both cashed on UConn ATS. I lost my loan bet that I posted with Mark Sears going under. Credit to Mark Sears. He was super efficient. Mm Mm-hmm. In low volume of attempts, I think around 13, 14 shot attempts for him. I probably three or four attempts at the free throw line. But when Castle and Diara were face guarding him, he couldn't get any sort of action. So that really came off of inbounds plays and ball screens and maybe just loose balls where he was able to get the ball from behind the arc. But credit to Sears. He beat me on the points prep. Plus money if you faded me there. So shout out to you if you did so. We know Castle is going to be able to hamper Braden Smith, which is why you may be looking at Braden Smith under 10.5 points over at BetMGM, right? Yeah, I am. And I think it was uh, minus 120 for under 10.5. I'm looking at that one. The reason why uh, Braden Smith obviously did not shoot well in this game. He hasn't shot well the last couple games. I kind of look at if you're in a national championship game against the UConn Huskies, this is not exactly a get-right situation for Braden Smith. If he's (laughs) At this point, you got to start thinking – if you're in your head and you shoot one for nine and you make that last three pointer in the game, and other than that, he's an over in the game. It, you know, probably not. If you look at the options offensively with Lawyer and Jones, and obviously Edie on the inside, 
I'm thinking, I'm wondering if Braden Smith is going to be thinking, I got to be more of a distributor in this game. This is not my time to get my shot right because I, every possession is going to count here. So in this situation, I think that Braden Smith might be looking more to be a distributor in this situation as opposed to a scorer. Um, tr trying to rely more and more on those better options offensively. So in this situation, it feels right to me that this is not a great get right game for Braden Smith. So I'm going to probably lean on the under here on the 10 and a half points. And he just went, to your point about assists, just went under the assist prop against NC State. That one lined at seven and a half. So to that point about it, you know, Smith being more of a distributor, which he has been throughout the entire tournament, Lance Jones to me is a very underrated factor in this game. Not that people aren't talking about him, but you look at his points prop over under 10 and a half. He went over against NC State, hit some big threes to really help Purdue pull away that juice towards the over the points prop of 10 and a half. He's also 50 to one to win most outstanding player. And if Edie underperforms, maybe scores in the 15 to 17 range, or if he gets in foul trouble, even in the first half, I could see a path where Jones wins most outstanding player. And to that point, he's not going to have castle on him. You would think unless he's just going off, but even if he is, that gives him a leg up with the points prop early and maybe the path to most, most outstanding player. And then as we transition over to Purdue defensively, he's going to likely have the responsibility of guarding Tristan Newton, who, while he could have success, Newton I'm talking about against Edie and Purdue and drop coverage, he ranks 28th in mid range efficiency and 30th in mid range frequency so also you go back to the first time UConn and Creighton squared off or second time I should say in Omaha you are uh, Creighton did a great job of blitzing those UConn ball screens to essentially force Newton into those mid-range shots and I'll look back at the numbers before I swing it to you but Newton wasn't the most efficient offensively in that game so mm -hmm. if Jones can have the impact that I think he can on both sides of the ball, especially if Edie doesn't have a great night because we know the voters are going to be swayed in Edie's direction if Purdue wins the game naturally. I kind of like my angle with Lance Jones. Yeah, with Lance Jones, I think it's going to really require a, a phenomenal shooting performance for him to get that. I think one of the things, like he he shot well last night. He shot four of nine from the three-point line. I think that was the mo that's the most three-pointers he's shot since since late January. Um, hit four, four threes, but that was the, the most he's hit since the game on January 31st against Purdue when, it, um, excuse me, against Northwestern when they, when he shot five of seven in that game. The other thing, you know, like Lance Jones, it, you know, I kind of think that Lance Jones has a little bit of a, you know, a, such a great shooter and a, and a scoring mentality and a reputation. And that was kind of the, the truth going in late January and early February where he scored in double digits in six of seven games, but all of a sudden now he's only scoring double digits. In, in two of the last six games, and one of those games he scored 12, and then the game last night he scored 14. Um, I think it's possible, and I, considering the odds, I completely understand it, but it's going to be one of those things where I think Lance Jones probably going to have to sink six or seven from three or seven of eight from three in order to be there. I think that's kind of the way he's going to have to get to be that, that most important player in this championship game. Um, just lately, he has not done it. He still has that reputation of a dead eye shooter. And I think you saw a little bit of it last night. If that continues, um, I think that's going to be great for him. But uh, boy, you know, it's, it's a tall order versus a team like UConn. And to his credit, he has improved with his shooting efficiency going back to his days at Southern Illinois. And that was, mm -hmm. you look back at the transfer portal, one of the biggest pickups in the off season, the only transfer Purdue took in. So as much as I hate on Painter, credit to him for A, his coaching job, because it's not like Purdue hasn't faced a physical team. I was thinking about that this morning. This isn't the easiest path. Yes, you could argue first two games for sure, but then you look back at UConn's defensive path, the op opponents they faced at the defensive end of the floor in adjusted defensive efficiency, and maybe you could pull up the numbers to kind of uh, highlight this for me, Eric. Stetson, 341st. Then you look at uh, Northwestern, 54th. And they didn't have Matthew Nicholson on the floor, which definitely was a downside for them, especially against Clinton. San Diego State, 11th. Illinois, 80th. And Alabama, 111th. Now, I know the Tide are playing better at that end of the floor, but 
I mentioned how Newton isn't the most efficient mid-range frequency. By the way, I looked this up. If you go back to the last time UConn and Creighton played in Omaha, Newton was very efficient from two, but a lot of those came at the rim and for and one opportunities, especially in the second half. When Creighton pulled away in the first half, they were hedging and getting running Newton off the three-point line to force him into some of those tougher mid-range jump shots. And that kind of shows up in his mid-range efficiency around the 30th percentile, which isn't great, below average. And then also, you look at how Purdue is going to try to defend Stefan Castle in this game because going into the game last night, the second of the two between Alabama and UConn, maybe Matt Painter thought he can get away with putting Fletcher Lawyer on Stefan Castle. Well, not if Castle is hitting threes, Two of six from deep against Alabama at least forced Bama to play him a little bit tighter around the arc. So how do you expect the defensive matchup to go between Purdue and UConn? Well, one of the things you touched on a little bit was what was intriguing to me was like we talked about the mid-range. How is the mid-range going to play into this? UConn right now, 341st in the country when it comes to the uh, mid-range attempt rate. That's something that they don't, there's a lot of teams that have that mentality. You know, I think we talked about Alabama had a similar mentality. It's all threes or you're going to get shots up close. They avoid those shots. One of the things that may work to the benefit of Purdue, you know, this is the, the Rick Bird mentality. And I always kind of talk about that. I love the Rick Bird mentality playing at Belmont. He was the first person that I remember that really avoided the mid-range shot like the plague and then encouraged it on the other end. Um, I, I always kind of think the game within the game. You know, we got to that mentality for a long time, and now a lot of coaches are probably thinking next level. How am I going to expose the mid-range game? If they're going to encourage me to shoot the mid-range shot, how can I be successful in scoring from those mid-range locations? That might be an advantage for Purdue in this game. Purdue does not shy away from the mid-range shot. 83rd in the country in mid-range attempt rate. 25th in adjusted mid-range percentage. Now, sometimes mid-range can be construed as how many of those are Edie? You know, is is Edie taking a 7-foot shot or a 6-foot shot? How many of those are coming through as mid-range shots? But I don't think it's just that. I think when you see this, you know, they're very two-dimensional. Uh, all UConn is offensively. And great, they're very, very good two-dimensionally from the three-point line on the inside. But the thing about Purdue is they add that dimension where they're content. They can actually take that mid-range shot and convert it. I wonder if that's going to be another thing that goes in favor of Purdue, which is another reason why I like that Purdue six and a half, uh, plus six and a half bet. Yeah, and I'm going to have a small bet to kind of finalize our bets here on the final edition of Outside Shots. For the season, I'm going to have a small bet on Purdue money line at plus 235. Implied probability for that is right around 30%. My numbers make it closer to plus 215, plus 220. Like I mentioned, around the four, four and a half range for me in terms of my uh, projected point spread for this game. So with UConn in the mid range, Spencer definitely has an advantage there. If you think UConn wins the game, Spencer probably goes over his scoring prop. And if UConn covers, I think Spencer will go over in that sense, especially against Edie and Drop. His points prop over at BetMGM, 13.5 juice to the over. Stefan Castle, his points prop over under 10.5 juice to the over. By the way, I wrote this up in my article going into the Final Four yesterday. If you looked at the most outstanding player odds entering the Final Four, Castle was around... 30 to 1, 30, 35 to 1. He's now around 3 to 1, three, hmm. I think plus 325 to win most outstanding player. I don't think he's going to be nearly as efficient offensively, even if Lawyer sags off still and Painter says, okay, we're going to still force Castle to beat us, even though he hit some shots against Bama, which I don't think would be the worst thing in the world. Now, is Klingon going to be able to have success against Zach Eady? You could argue maybe yes on some of those rim rolls because. Edie doesn't necessarily want to drop back and foul on an attempt at the rim. He did a really good job of that, especially in the second half against Tennessee. If Tennessee had a layup at the rim or a potential alley-oop at the rim, he didn't try to attack it and try to block it or pick up a foul then unnecessarily, which he's elite at. He's elite at drawing fouls as much as I want to knock him for that too and knock maybe some of the calls. And he's elite at not getting in foul trouble. So even if Klingon, I would actually lean towards Klingon going under the points prop, the which is lined at 14 and a half juice to the under at bet MGM. I think Purdue wins the game, which is why I would rather take money line than the point spread. I think it's either UConn by double digits or Purdue winning the game. I don't, I get your 
point spread play for sure just because we both agree that the line is inflated. But because of that, I see more value in the money line. But still, both of our, our analysis leads towards Purdue keeping the game close and potentially winning the game outright. It's interesting because it's kind of a similar mentality to a lot of people what they had versus Alabama. I think we said the same kind of thing. Like Alabama, if they get hot and they play the right game and they shock UConn, they can win this game. Otherwise, it's going to be a double-digit loss. Um, the only difference is I think the poise of Purdue is a little bit more. I always kind of looked at Alabama and said defensively, that was the big problem for Alabama. Purdue is a different animal. Purdue can actually play defense. They actually rank in the top 10 or 15 for me defensively. Um, I think the one thing that's really going to be a problem going forward, and I kind of said this going into the tournament, this has always been kind of the Achilles heel for Purdue. Kind of, I always bring up these little things like Marquette always had these, the same Achilles heel of not being able to clean the glass. Um, in this situation, I've always said about Purdue, too much reliance on Zach Eady. And the other thing we saw a little bit of it last night was turnovers. How reliable is it going to be with those, with Purdue's guards? And that was one of my concerns was, that senior guard, those senior guards from NC State versus those sophomore guards from Purdue, was that going to be a problem? Purdue did not play a fantastic game last night offensively. They turned Two over the ball. Two backcourt violations yes. for Smith in the first back half. Back to back. Yes, right, almost back to back. Um, and, and so that's kind of the thing that's ongoing for me, something that I worry about for Purdue as well. And if you're going to get that defensive pressure from UConn, is that going to continue to be a problem for the Boilermakers in this game? So one last thing that I want to bring up before we get out of here, because we haven't really touched on it. The total, which you kind of alluded to, I, I think you have a little bit shorter than the total right now, 145.5, 146. You mm. said in the 142 range, right? 142.5, yep. Okay. With the pace theoretically being slower, like if we think about projecting how this game is going to play out, even though UConn is elite in troll, well, with that said, UConn, while they want to play slower, they are elite in transition around 1.22, 1.22. To one points per possession in transition. If this game is more in the half court, I think that favors Purdue. Like you go back to the point you made about Alabama hitting a lot of threes, high variance team trying to increase the possessions. That's where it kind of negates you when you're trying to pull off the upset. You want to generate a fewer possessions than your opponent and shoot a lot of threes, which makes you more high variance. Purdue plays inside out through 80. So in a sense, they are a high variance team in that way. And they want to play slower because they are more efficient in the half court than they are in transition. And that's how, honestly, you're going to be able to beat UConn, even though you look back at Illinois, like the best comp for me in terms of beating UConn before we get out of here, going back to that first half, Illinois probably defensively gave UConn their toughest test in that first half. Besides Klingon at the rim, UConn didn't have much in the half court. Now they missed their fair share of threes, which they didn't do against Alabama. They were much more efficient from behind the arc. If Klingon isn't scoring like he was against Illinois, which you wouldn't expect him to do at that sort of efficiency because it's against Edie, Illinois had some success in the half court. Purdue, we mentioned, has some advantages in the half court against Klingon drop coverage. Now, maybe you could say if Samson Johnson is on the floor, more athletic, but that also gives Edie uh, an advantage down low against Samson Johnson, assuming right. Edie is on the floor when Johnson's on the court. So all of our analysis here kind of leads towards Purdue co covering, if not winning the game outright. You know, it's interesting you mentioned this because I kind of have the same opinion. It's, it's funny that Purdue plays at a higher pace than UConn does. Purdue is 248th in game pace for me. UConn way down to 333, you know, number 333. But so why do we feel that Purdue is in a better situation if the game is slower? But it does feel that way for me. The reason why, I think, is because UConn can beat you any different way. They have their preferred right. pace of play against anybody, but they, they have proven time and time again that you can run against them. You can slow it up. You can do whatever you want. We're just going to beat you whatever style of play you want to play, and that's the way it's going to be. And that's the reason why I look at this and go, I think from a standpoint, I think Purdue is going to be far more comfortable playing a slower game, but the slower the game you play, the more you're in the wheelhouse for UConn. That's the problem. Right. With that said, we are taking Purdue. He, <laughs> Eric Haslam, has Purdue six and a half, right? Plus six and a half. And All I right. did see plus. I did see at least one plus seven this morning. So it is. It is still growing. I'm still going with the six and a half, though. 
Okay, and I'm going to be taking Purdue on the money line, plus 235. Remember to price shop for the best odds over at thelines.com. You can follow Eric on X at Haslametrics. You can follow me at Eli Herskovich. Be sure to use our promo code with BetMGM. The lines, one word, you bet $5, you get $150 in bonus bets back. If you're listening or watching to us in North Carolina, be sure to use all the best promo codes with Sports Betting Now Legal in North Carolina. You can find all of our bets in the Lions Discord channel. The link is over at thelines.com in the top right-hand corner. So on top of my Purdue Moneyline bet, I'm going to have a small bet on Lance Jones going over his points prop 10.5, and an even smaller bet on Jones winning most outstanding player at 50 to 1. Small, 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 like couch change on Jones winning MOP. Just because I think the path is there after a relatively efficient game against North Carolina State. Will you jump on that with me, Eric, or are you staying away? Yeah, you know what? Maybe I will. You, I, I kind of jumped on the Clemson train with you. So maybe I'll take a look at this and say, maybe, like you said, I love the idea, the couch change idea. Just throw a, <laughs> throw a very, very small amount, have a little fun with it. And then all of a sudden, if the guy all of a sudden knocks down five threes in the first half, you're feeling pretty good about that bet. So... It might be something worth trying. The one thing we haven't discussed is with the eclipse happening on Monday night, we know that's going to be a UConn against the world approach yet again. Of course, the eclipse <laughs> is happening when UConn is in the national championship game. Naturally, yes, yes. I, I actually have a friend of mine who's going down to watch it down in like southern Illinois. So, yeah, weird stuff happens when the eclipse occurs. So who knows what's going to happen on that particular day. <laughs> He is Eric Haslam at Haslametrics. I'm Eli Herskovich. Thanks for watching and listening to our season finale edition of Outside Shots. So long, everybody, and good luck with your national championship bets.